Well, first, let me uh, start out by just thanking Tiago, my friend Tiago Cavaco, for uh, setting me up with this talk. Uh, Tiago, actually, when we talked about uh, what we were going to do tonight, uh, he said, Mark, I've got a title for you, and I want you to create an entire talk around this title that I think is incredible. And so he, he, he literally just gave me the title and said, go for it. And so here, here we are tonight um, with this talk that is titled Lisboa Nowe Hollywood. Lisbon is not Hollywood. And so Tiago, thank you for, um, for giving me the title and allowing me the, the freedom and flexibility to, to create this talk based on the title. Um, this is actually the only the second time that I have had the privilege of, of speaking, giving a talk in English over the last 15 years here in Portugal. And so uh, the first time I, I was able to, me and my wife, Hannah, we gave a talk here at Igreja de Lapa um, to talk about our experiences uh, one time at the church. And this is actually the only the second time uh, that I've been able to give a talk here in English. Everything that we do is in Portuguese. And so this is such a privilege for me to be able to give a talk in English. Um, it's really funny because when I, when I switch into English, because in our ministry here in Portugal over the 15 years we've been here, it, everything is in Portuguese. And so I switch into English, people kind of look at me a little funny and, and kind of give me that look, right? Uh, and so even before um, when I was going to get up and, and give this talk, uh, one of our members at the church, Nandu, he looked at me and he says, Mark, you're so different when you speak in English. So thank you, Nandu. Thank you for, yes, it's a little bit different, obviously, um, with being able to speak in English. Um, also, as I, as I start this off, uh, you know, Tiago gave me 30 minutes and I asked him, I said, Tiago, do you want 30 American minutes or 30 Portuguese minutes. And he laughed and said, just do what you got to do. So uh, this will be a 30 American minutes. Uh, Lisbon isn't Hollywood. It's not the place of glitz or glamour or where you go to punch your meal ticket, which for many who desire the rags to riches story, Lisbon seems like the last place they would want to be. But allow me to tell you what Lisbon is really like not from the perspective you've been lulled into believing, but through the eyes of an American, an estrangeiro, a pastor and a pilgrim who fell in love with this city. Lisbon, it's a gritty reality and a crossroads between old and new. It doesn't ignore your ugliness and at the same time tries to make you believe in something greater than yourself. You can see this in the way that the city lives and breathes. It's not perfect and it's not a fairy tale dream. It's not the place that you go to feel better about yourself. In fact, it's a place where you come face to face with the stark reality of how little you truly know. So you might be asking, why is that a good thing? Why can't we have Hollywood and Disneyland and the Lakers all together in this fantasy pipe dream that we deserve? Well, if you want to lose your soul, go to Hollywood. If you want to gain your soul, come to Lisbon. So I have a confession to make. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. Oftentimes, we missionaries are sent out from America, and we like to think that we have sent out our very best, the cream of the crop, the smartest and the bravest, the self-starters who will make a huge splash, a huge difference. We often think wrongly, I might add, that something big might happen just based on willpower or enthusiasm alone. The American will show up and put everything into order. And you know what? It's dead wrong. Unless, of course, you're into American imperialism and the modern missions movement. But quite frankly, those people get chewed up and spit out. They get taken to the cleaners when they show up here in Lisbon. I know when I showed up 15 years ago, people might have asked, they sent this guy, this guy, and before you do the Portuguese thing and tell me it's okay, let me tell you how I've proved this over and over. But strangely enough, in doing so, God burned off my Americanness and replaced it with a Portuguese spirit that echoes what I want to communicate to you tonight. Ironically, by staying in Lisbon, I gained my soul. So tonight, let me share with you five ways that God has done that over and over during these past 15 years. The first one, language missteps and the long road of adaptation. Language missteps and the long road of adaptation. I am the undisputed king 
of language missteps. And what's a language misstep, misstep, you might ask? Oh, it's just me wanting to introduce my wife to people. And instead of using the verb apresentar, for months I kept using the verb apetecer. I mean, can it get any worse than that? And to make it worse, I did this in church when I was supposed to be introducing my wife. I literally asked people if they wanted to apetecer my wife. I'm just thankful that no one took me up on the offer. Or one time when I told a bunch of my friends that American food isn't fresh and they love to eat their food with preservatives. They were frantically waving and telling me, Mark, 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 that's not the right word. But I thought they didn't understand, so I kept telling it over and over and louder and louder. I said, no, no, you don't understand. They love to eat their food with preservatives. And the stories go on and on and on. The language missteps. I've got stories and stories of them. I showed up to Portugal and had to learn a completely new language, a completely new culture and a new way of living. I had to quickly decide that mistakes don't define me, but faithfulness does. Faithfulness defines me. It's about getting knocked down and getting back up time after time after time again. Lisbon and the Portuguese language just does that to you. It humbles you. It puts you in your place. It recreates you from the ground up. And it's, it's ironic when I think about it. We didn't choose Portugal. Portugal chose us. God sent us to this country, sight unseen. We didn't come here because we saw the beautiful travel magazines, the amazing beaches that you sometimes see nowadays. And Portugal looks so attractive. We had to learn to love Lisbon through the ups and downs through the mistakes, the good times and the hard times, to understand that the charm grows on you and never lets go. Number two, being surrounded by true genius and knowing my place within real talent. Being surrounded by true genius and also knowing my place amidst real talent. I quickly realized that part of the journey for me was being okay with working alongside truly gifted people. It was about accepting who God made me to be, normal and average, and trust me, I am not special. And where God in his sovereign wisdom decided to place me in ministry. Despite all my mishaps in language, despite all of those years of learning culture and understanding how this all works, figuring out my place in this ministry that God has given to us. Oftentimes we are tempted to leave where God has placed us in an attempt to find meaning and significance in what we do. And so we jump around, we look for the next best thing. Uh, we chase after what we think will be the next great adventure, trying to fill that hole that we find in us. Yet time and time again, God has reminded me that it's better to embrace Lisbon, where he has placed us, and reject the fantasy of Hollywood. Not because Hollywood is evil. Well, it kind of is but that's another talk, but because it allows us to be okay with comfort-driven mediocrity. Hollywood allows us to be comfortable with that mediocrity. For me, it's working alongside true genius and real talent, not in some faraway fantasy land or trying to go to the next place and chase that, but right here in Lisbon, allowing that to happen right here in the place where I'm at. I get to work with some of the sharpest and creative minds I've ever known. And who would have thought I would find these people right here in this place? We are tempted every day to think that the sharpest and creative minds can only be found out there, around the next corner, around the next adventure, and that other place long from here, in some mythical place that we've created in our minds. Sadly, so many of us leave to chase this never-ending cycle while ignoring, ignoring the incredible depth of talent that exists right here in front of us. Let me put it this way. I wouldn't trade Tiago for Piper. I wouldn't trade Philippe for Dever. I wouldn't trade Manel the Machine for the world's riches or Hugo and Tiago for a cushy senior pastor job in the U.S. making 200 k a year. I'm convinced that the genius that I work with every day pushes me to be a better man, a better pastor. 
even if I never achieve what the world defines as success. Number three, embracing your simplicity while leaning into the complexity. Embracing your simplicity while leaning into the complexity. I've had to learn how to embrace my simplicity and at the same time, live and breathe the complexity of this city and culture. One of the biggest mistakes people make, whether you're coming to Lisbon or you're from here, is this paradox. People coming as estrangeiros, as foreigners, think that everything is simple, and people here think that everything is complex. Europeans think that everything is complex. And I've learned that there's a paradox at play, a biblical paradox that helps us embrace Lisbon regardless of where you're from. But really, regardless how long you've been here as well, whether you've grown up here and spent your entire life here, or whether you're coming here to work um, for the first time. The idea of decomplicating the complex, something that Portuguese people struggle to do, Europeans struggle to do that, while complicating a simplistic approach, rejecting, in a sense, that simplistic approach, something that foreigners really struggle to do. The balance I've learned is to think simply about yourself while embracing a complexity of life and ministry. Do you see how that works? Less of you means more for others. A simplistic understanding of yourself and a complex understanding of others. For me, it's understanding that the path of faithfulness is decomplicating myself and understanding that I'm a lot less important than I'd like to think. I'm a lot less complex than I'd like to think. And you know, let me tell you, that's a bit scary. It's a, it's a little bit scary to embrace that idea because sometimes buying into the myth that we're complicated makes it seem like our value is greater than if we were simplistic and understandable. In fact, when I first started preaching it here in Portuguese, it was a monumental task to begin preaching in Portuguese. I remember it, it, it took me sometimes a week or two weeks just to prepare a sermon. And I would prepare the sermon, get it all ready, and then I'd, I'd actually have one of my, my daughters correct the sermon because, of course, their grammar was a million times better than mine and, and still is. And, and it, it, was, it was almost embarrassing how much red ink was, but it was almost like an, a small animal had been murdered on, on my sermon papers because of all the ink that was spilled correcting my grammar. Um, but when I started preaching, um, at first I, I thought I, I was doing such a great job because after the sermon, somebody would say, wow, that was, uh, that was, that was really simple. Wow, that was, um, I understood everything. And I kind of felt like, wow, I'm really getting this. This is going great until Tiago told me, Remember Tiago, he, he said, he said, you know, maybe they're not complimenting you because here, if it's so simple and understandable, it's probably not that great of a thing. The more complex and difficult it is to understand, then you're really preaching a good sermon. And so I had to deal with that idea like maybe they're not complimenting me about my sermon style. But I want to flip this upside down for you and tell you that your greatest need right now is to embrace your simplicity while leaning into the complexity of life and relationships. And so de decomplicating ourselves, but leaning into the complexity that is life, there's a big difference. And when we switch that around is when we get really, really messed up. That way your importance isn't wrapped up in how complex you are, but in the simple and straightforward way that the gospel changes your life. So that you can work within the complexity of what it means to live and breathe in the spider web of relationships that we are called to pursue. Number four knowing and utilizing your gifts, knowing and utilizing your gifts and, and really finding the role that you play utilizing those gifts. When we don't understand how to use our gifts, we get really frustrated. And we can see this, especially as, as people arrive to Lisbon, people come to Europe for the first time. And, and after the honeymoon period wears off, it gets really hard and really frustrating for people. They don't know how to fit in. What is their role? How they're supposed to use their gifts. And typically when we get frustrated, we get uncomfortable. And when we're frustrated and uncomfortable, we begin to dream of distant lands and fantasize about that amazingly successful, incredibly wealthy person that everybody loves. And we, we want that for ourselves. And so what we do is we, we think about, well, if I was just there, or if I was just in a different situation, 
uh, people would understand me and, and and people would recognize the the talent that I have and and they would they would they would want me around and give me opportunities. I don't know about you, but I sometimes struggle with this with the Walter Mitty syndrome. Do you remember Walter Mitty? Uh, Mitty was a fictional character in James Thurber's first short story published in 1939 in The New Yorker. Mitty is a daydreamer who has a vivid fantasy life, to put it mildly. He imagines himself as a wartime pilot, an emergency room surgeon, and even as a devil-may-care killer. Yet none of it is real. It only happens inside his mind. I often catch myself pulling a Mitty and dreaming of the what-ifs in life. What if it was like this? What if I was more successful? What if more people recognized me for the talents that I had? What if I lived in London or Paris or New York instead of being trapped here in this place? And the issue is the more we live in some made up world, the less present we are here in this place to know and use the gifts that we have been given, to fight for understanding how to use those gifts in the role that God has placed in our lives. It took me several years to figure this out, how to use my gifts here. And I realize saying that it's going to frustrate some of you that are listening to this because you want to immediately begin to use your gifts. And so when I say it took me years to discover this, uh, we want everything quick and fast and easy, Uh, but it took years. It was a daily struggle of trusting the Lord, even when I was experiencing failure. In fact, out of failure, I began to understand exactly how God would use my gifts here in this country, in this city. Oftentimes we think the opposite, don't we? We'll discover how to use our giftings because we're so successful and it'll be evident and people will praise us for what we're doing, what we're accomplishing. But you know what? I found the opposite to be true. I only truly discovered how to use my gifts when I faced the deep pit of failure, suffering, and despair, being at the end of your rope. It was there that I had nowhere else to turn. I wasn't propped up by man's accolades or false pretense of self-importance, but only by God's grace and mercy, only by his call, only by his doing, only by his grace and mercy and his love. It was the middle of the night, dark night of the soul where God helped me see how I could be used here in Lisbon. And really, honestly, out of, out of failure came the most amazing opportunity uh, that we've had during these 15 years. Um, it was after uh, working on a church plant and, and, and seeing that church plant go down in flames, fail miserably. Um, and there's a million and one reasons why that happened. But in the midst of this failure, uh, Tiago came to me and said, you know what, I think we can work with you now. And this was after years of struggling and toiling here in Portugal in the very beginning. And finally, Tiago says, comes to me and says, we can work with you. I said, Tiago, hold on. Do you mean to say that because I failed, you want to now work with me? That makes no sense. Uh, Typically, we we don't want to work with somebody that's failed. We want to work with somebody that is successful, that demonstrates capacity, uh, that can do anything, that has a can-do attitude, lots of enthusiasm. And Tiago said, oh, no, Mark, no, Mark. Because you failed, you're one of us. He says, if you Americans can come in here and snap your fingers and make all this work without our help, what does God need us for? What does God need the church for? And so it was out of that failure that God used in our lives to start a beautiful partnership with Igreja de Lapa, with Tiago and Philippe, with the entire church. And over, over the following years, this partnership grew and, and began to incredibly be used by God to continue to do the work that he had called all of us, the church, to accomplish together. It wasn't just one missionary that decided to show up in this country, but it was God using his entire church to accomplish what he wanted to do. I don't know why, but God uses this city to beat out arrogance and self-determination and replaces it with humility and perspective. That's what happened to us. And it leads me to the last thing I've learned, but certainly the most important. The fifth one, all for God's glory. All for God's glory. It's, if it's not about God's glory, then pack your bags right now and move to Hollywood. At least you'll get your 15 minutes of fame. You'll meet some stars, make some money. But if it's 
if it's about God's glory, if everything we do is about God's glory, then Lisboa and Noe Hollywood isn't just a talk on a Saturday night. It's the way you've chosen to define your entire existence. It's a completely different perspective, a completely different path, a desire to know and live that God's glory is most important. And I've learned that here. I've learned that here. More succinctly than any other place, I've learned that here in this city, in Lisbon. It's not a perfect city, but that's exactly why it works. The imperfection, the grittiness, and the daily grind produce and reflect what life is all about. That despite our sin and rebellion, God has come to us with grace and mercy. It's about that long road of obedience in the same direction that God uses to shape us into something beyond where we are today. It's believing that good things indeed are happening in this place, in this city, in this country. And we're a part of that majestic plan that God is doing to reveal his glory. Great things are happening in Lisbon and all across this beautiful country of Portugal. You either run from it or embrace it. It isn't easy, but that's not how great things are made. In fact, great things come from the crucible of suffering and difficulty. Easy, cheap, and fast, that's McDonald's, baby. And you don't want anything to do with it. Mac is a great place to meet your friends, to grab a hamburger, but it's a terrible philosophy for your life. And ironically, that's the lie. That's a lie that we, we sell ourselves. That's a lie of the American dream, that you can have everything, and you can have everything right now. You can do anything, you can be anything, you can have everything, and you can have it right now. It's a lie. But the Portuguese dream is something deeper and more profound. It's digging deep in the middle of challenge and hardship and forging ahead to create the unexpected. The truly original piece of work, the truly original work of art or music that captivates the soul and speaks to a generation not duped by the commercialization of talent. It speaks to a profound level that reaches to the deepest part of our soul and calls us to worship. Pure, unadulterated, raw. And that is Portugal, my friends. And it reflects God's glory. Tiago once told me that people like me are welcome to come to Europe, but we need to come to Europe and die. To experience death so that we can embrace life. This is the message of the gospel, but also the only way to survive in Portugal, to come and to die. This was my experience, and it really needs to be your experience too. Because in death, we realize who we truly are, who we are created to be. I arrived here 15 years ago, ready to take this country by storm, to change it, to see it won, uh, to see everything change because of my presence here. But the storm that showed up and happened deep inside of me led to my death and my resurrection. I'm not talking about salvation. God had already accomplished that for me through Jesus on the cross, but death to myself, a death to my Hollywood. So many people here in Lisbon are looking for success, and what they truly need is death. What you need tonight is death. So many people wanting to avoid death leave Lisbon and ironically wither away slowly while pursuing what they think will bring them happiness. Or they sit here and wither away, not doing anything. But life is not found more abundantly in Hollywood. It is found here, in this place in our daily grind of surrender and obedience. Lisboa, now a Hollywood, de facto, a muito melhor.